A team, in this video, I'm probably gonna cause some folks to develop some small particles of sand down in their most inner moist nether regions. But if that's you, have no fear. At the end of this video, I will give you a four count exercise that will help eradicate them things before they turn to pearls. Team, I get asked all the time about my gear loadouts as far as why I don't carry a tourniquet. In this video, I'm gonna tell you a point blank why, as well as share some thoughts and some arguments as far as why the tourniquet might be the most overhyped up, oversold, least used piece of gear on the market that we're trying to add into our kit bags. But I'll also tell you when and where and why you should have one and how to work through that decision making process and show you how to make a field experience tourniquet when in need. Let's get to this. So in my bag today, I do have a cat tourniquet. And I wanna show you a couple, three mistakes maybe uh, that folks make when buying, purchasing, and then getting ready to use the tourniquet as well. So we got, we got a lot uh, in this particular episode. I'm looking forward to your thoughts and your comments down below. So make sure you leave them about the tourniquets, about my arguments pro and against tourniquets as well as anything else that you want to add into the conversation this is not medical advice man this is for entertainment and conversation only i'm going to challenge and encourage you to find some local stop the bleed courses get out there and get some training all right so tourniquets have been around for a really long time like this is what we think of when we think of a tourniquet which is the cat or the combat application tourniquet that the number one reason for fatalities in a combat environment is the loss of blood it is that hemorrhaging right and so what we did uh, in the service uh, and then for the whole stinking world is we developed a simple one-handed uh, application that can be deployed and used and so this is a required item that if you deploy this is going to be on your person and you're probably going to have one on your leg or in, up in your shoulder back in the day. You're going to have one in your IFAC. You're going to have one in all your vehicles. There's going to be tourniquets coming out the yin-yang. In the United States, Riggs says that over 60,000 fatalities happen each and every year as a direct result of the loss of blood. That being said, what Riggs also would let you know is that only 2,000 tourniquets are used in the United States. In the US, it's over a couple million tourniquets sold each and every single year. But only a couple thousand are used. And I can't tell you if those 2,000 used were done effectively and it saved a life or if it didn't. We do know from statistics that a tourniquet has a 60% probability of saving somebody's life if it's applied at the right time for, for the right reason. So we could assume that, you know, of those, you know, a couple thousand that are used, that what, 15, 1600 may have been, lives may have been saved because of a tourniquet. That said, you know, again, on, on the negative, on the downside of the, of the tourniquet, it is a big business. Within just a few short years, there will be over a billion dollars of tourniquets sold each and every single year throughout the world. How much, are, how much of that is actually going to save lives? How many are getting thrown in the trash? Who knows, but it is something to consider. You know, when you're going to add in uh, tourniquets into your kit, I know people who will go out and buy two tourniquets for each and every single person. Well, at 30, 40 bucks a pop, man, that's a lot of dadgum money. And tourniquets should not be used as training aids as well as used for real life scenarios so like this tourniquet will only ever be used in training environments the way a tourniquet works is by using a windlass show this to you a little bit gooder and what happens is after it's applied and you already have a little bit of resistance from the person and you go and turn this windlass as it's turning it is drawing the tourniquet up onto itself tightening it down which is going to stop the blood flow. Right, of course, Riggs and I, man, we're not here to tell you uh, where tourniquets should be placed, when or if. There's been a lot of changes over the years and it's going to change again, whether we apply them as a last resort, whether or not we apply them on the, on the first available opportunity, whether we put them up high and tight or down closer to that particular injury. 
These are all things that are going to change over the course of time based off of the evidence of them actually being used. All right, so now let's talk about the three most common mistakes people make when buying, employing, and, and storing tourniquets. And the first one is that they will leave them in the plastic packaging that they came with, and they're all nice and sealed, and everything is all, you know, ready to go. It's not ready to go, man. You have to break that thing out of the package, and you need to get it set up. So I will take one out, and I will inspect it, make sure that everything is G to G. That's good to go, right? And after I see no issues uh, with anything, then I will take my tourniquet and I will take that red tab and feed it through a few inches and make sure that that opening, that, that circumference is big enough to go around an extremity, right? It's big enough to go around any extremity at all. That way, if I have to self-apply it, I can do so and it's ready to go. I don't have to worry about taking it out of the package and doing it. If I'm going to apply this onto somebody else, it's also ready to go. I don't have to think about it because now we're talking about muscle memory. We're talking about a, a traumatic event that you're trying to have them to focus through. And you want to take as many decisions that will lead to failure out of the equation as possible. The second mistake that people make when applying a tourniquet is that they will take a tourniquet without thinking and they will just simply throw it over an extremity right and it will be like okay now i'm good to go wrong answer right you thought about it you applied it so that you were pulling towards your torso right pull towards your own heart now i can get it much tighter by pulling it towards my heart does that make sense now that we have this thing ready to go, we can go ahead and start cranking down on it. And this is where the third biggest mistake is that people make when applying a tourniquet is that they will go and they will tighten, crank down once or twice and call it a wrap. Wrong answer. What you need to do is completely obliterate that distal pulse. Tourniquets are going to hurt. They are going to hurt freaking bad. And if I was going to actually apply this to somebody, I'm going to make them whine and squeal like Riggs is doing right now for that stick. I, I'm going to keep cranking on this thing. In a real life scenario, I'm going to go at least one more again until that pull stops. That freaking hurts. So again, man, tourniquets are going to hurt. They're not going to feel good. They're not made to feel good. They're made to save your life. Three big mistakes that people make when using storing and employing tourniquets of course after you get a tourniquet applied make sure you do write down the time because you're going to forget later on and that time is going to be a critical factor for those emergency personnel to determine the consequences of how long that tourniquet has been on we have to think through some basic risk management operations right so there are two key factors in this one is the probability of an event happening right when i'm out walking through the woods as it relates to tourniquets, it is extremely unlikely and not probable at all for some sort of event to occur when I can't control the bleeding through direct pressure. However, comma, pause for dramatic effect. If I go to a range, if I deploy, if I'm working in an area or an environment where I know that there is a higher probability of rounds flying down range, then I need to be prepared to mitigate those risks. So we have the probability on, on one slider. On the other slider, we have the severity of that event happening. The consequence of getting shot or getting wounded, some piece of shrapnel or some other traumatic event is pretty severe for that individual. So again, these are all decisions that only you can make. What can I do? What do I have in my kit bag? As I'm moving out through the wilderness environment, the happenstance of you know, falling and cutting myself maybe with a knife and having a really deep laceration, and I can't stop the bleeding with just some direct pressure. Mistake number four when it comes to tourniquets is that people don't do anything to begin with. And so we have to be prepared and ready to execute a plan of action that is going to help save that person's life. So let's get through working and talking about a field expedient tourniquet. You need to have a couple things in mind. One, the type of material that you're gonna use. 
550 cord, for example, while you can crank that down tight, is going to have a significant impact when it comes to nerve damage, right? And so if you're using string or cordage of any kind, you're gonna cause some significant nerve damage. There, the, another common one that we see, uh, quite frankly, all the time, is people talking about using leather belts. Now, leather belts actually have the correct width that we're looking for, as opposed to you know a thin piece of cordage. Uh, however, unlike cordage, you're not going to be able to crank down uh, that leather belt like you think you're going to. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So you're not going to be able to get it tight enough in order to stop. So you're not going to be able to get it tight enough to uh, stop that bleeding. Well, we need a couple other items, and most of the time we have these items uh, in our pack. Most of us carry first aid supplies or materials. I'm no exception to the rule. And in this case, uh, I do have a couple cravats in here that we're going to use and get set up. It doesn't have to be a cravat, but these two simple items can save a life. Again, it could be any sort of material that we can roll up and get to about that two inch width that can go around the extremity and be tied and secured. So a cravat, uh, military issued one each are some great survival tools for a variety of purposes and this is not an exception to the rule and as it comes out of the package it's about uh, as wide as we want it it could be a little bit thinner that's fine take our cravat around the extremity tie an overhand knot Take a stick or other improvised windlass and finish that square knot by applying another overhand knot. Now I can crank down on this windlass. Mm. Mm. Now we stop that freaking bleeding. I can take a second cravat, bring it around that windlass. Again, secure it with a square knot. Now we have a field expedient tourniquet that we've been able to use to stop the bleeding. Right now we can carry on with some other life-saving principles, including treating for shock. All right, team, there you go. A few thoughts and comments about tourniquets themselves, some problems with them, some good things about them, as well as issues and challenges that I've seen from my training and experience that people have when they go to employ them and how to make and improvise a field expedient tourniquet. Looking forward to your thoughts and your comments down below. So make sure you leave them. Consider sharing this out with a friend or battle buddy as well. That way we can continue to keep this conversation rolling. As always, I appreciate all you guys. And until then, you stay out there, you keep grinding, and you stay stoked. You know, it's a little known fact that Tears of Akami will also satisfy most first aid requirements. Oh, come on. That's what I'm talking about. My flash happens to be filled with them every time that you do like, subscribe, and share, and do all that good stuff. So I appreciate you guys. Demon, if my thoughts and opinions on the tourniquet was too much to bear and you started to develop some sand deep up into the nether regions of your body and it's starting to create some pearls or if you already have some and you need to eradicate them from your body simple four count exercise that 60 percent of the time it works all the time the starting position is the straddle stance with your left hand on your hip and your right hand up over the top of your head, fingers fully extended and joined, and palm facing the marching surface. Count one is you're going to squat down and tap the top of your head. Count two, return back to the starting position. Count three, repeat count one. 
count four, return back to the starting position and sound off with the number of repetitions performed. One, one, one. At full cadence, it looks as such. One, two, three, one. One, two, three, two. two. One, two, three, three. three. One, two, three, four. four. Team, and that's all you need to get them pearls up out of your system. Come on, even Riggs agrees. Team, if you want to master your craft and develop your tactical virtue, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that notification bell so that you can stay up to date on future content. Consider becoming a channel member. It's going to give you exclusive access to content not available to anybody else. I appreciate you guys. Until then, you stay out there, you keep grinding, and you stay stoked.